Go. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Jim. Hey, how you doing? Jim, you have the funnest name in the world. Jim, Jim, Jim. Jim, Jiminy. Jim, 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 Jiminy Cricket now. Um, Jim, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but if I had to give the the driving steering wheel, the, the road to success, the path to progress, where would you take it, man? Where would I take it? Um, I would take it uh, down paths. I love paths. I love tracks. I love routeways. I love uh, the big open road. And um, so I would, I would, I would take you along on one of my walks. I would, I would like to stroll down a little walk down either memory lane or maybe a, a path of what you feel like you enjoy most into the world. How about that? That's a deep one. Well, that's true. Um, what do I enjoy most in the world? Well, I'm an archaeologist, so um, I love anything to do with the past, you know, the, the further back in time, the, the more it interests me. Um, and I love landscapes. I love, so I love the historic landscape. Which, um, like, for instance, like with archaeology, that's such a big, 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 huge, um, to quote Donald Trump, that's such a large, vast amount of like history. What do you particularly prefer like because my mascot's the dodo bird so i like an underdog <laughs> character but i also love the glacial period i think that was like a very interesting thing i don't know if it was because of ice age the movie that kind of sparked my interest yeah. into it but more on the fact of like i don't know the animals just seemed more primal to me than the ones that like well we have today yeah well the whole the whole landscape was more primal wasn't it i mean it was wilder and you know in Somewhere like Britain, where it's quite, you know, the landscape is quite tame and the animals are quite tame. Actually, you know, you don't have to go very far back in time uh, to start finding things like wolves and um, uh, cave bears and huge, great big um, cattle known as oryx, which were at times, you know, sort of six foot at the shoulder. Um, so, you know, we, we don't have to go back very far until we... To, to get to sort of a much more, you know, what I would describe as a wilder landscape. And, you know, I, I, I love the, the glacial period too, um, but that's quite a bleak landscape. Uh, the, the landscape that really excites me actually was just after the end of the last ice age. And we start getting sort of this rewilding of, of, um, uh, of, the, of the landscape, this sort of what we, what we call a, a wild wood developing, you know, thick woodland right across the United Kingdom, right across uh, Europe and the Americas. Um, and of course, at this time, Britain and Europe were attached by yeah. a patch of land and all of that was, you know, wooded and wild and wonderful and people and animals roamed across this landscape. Now, when you look at a thing of moss, on a side of a building or a side of a tree. Does that, does that excite you a little bit? Cause that, to me, that's like, it's interesting. Like everyone likes like, I want an old stone cottage or something with like moss on the side. I'm like, man, I saw a video of Bill Nye, the science guy. And he was talking about what would happen if all of humanity was just gone. What would the planet do? And it started showing like they, they showed an old playground and this old playground had been abandoned for like 20 something years. And it was like the metal swings and the bars that like, who the hell builds a playground of metal on a blistering hot day where it's a hundred degree weather and the heat just you burn your hands off but it showed the moss and the vines going all up on the playground and like it looked like it was a like i am legend when he's driving through new york city and there's just trees and lions everywhere i'm like oh man i like that yeah is it cool I, I i love it i love thinking about what the landscape what well what what places were like um or would be like if we were just to remove humans and just to allow things to decay and just erode you know I've, I've only recently moved into my my lovely mossy cottage i live in a um i live in a quarry an old quarry down at the bottom so i'm below ground level and uh, it's it, it, it's it's a lovely old cottage but it's um uh really i do you know, i just find it really fascinating to lie in the garden and i do do this quite often lie in the garden and just imagine what it was like what it would be like if we were just to allow everything just to just to become whatever it is, you know, the, the, the apple trees to have apples fall on the ground and just turn into 
um, you know, multitude of, of apple trees themselves to allow the um, concrete to break up and the weeds to grow, the ivy to, to you know, to eventually, you know, break through the windows and um, sort of enter the house. You know, I, I love this idea of trees growing out of my top floor and out through sort of the broken roof and um, deer cluttering up the stairwell and living up in this little kind of uh, house forest thing. Is that weird? Do I, I mean, do you have those sort of fantasies as well? I'm not a type that has a house plant. Like I've, my, some of my family members, you walk into their house and there's like 80 ferns all over the place. I'm like, is this real? They're like, that's real. And I'm like, it just, they just let them grow out, which is cool. It looks very, very interesting. I like them when they hang from like the windowsills or when they're kind of out of the way. I don't like things in my maneuverability through my home. I don't like having a path like in hoarders where they just make one path to walk on and everything else is just littered with whatever. But my um grandparents, for instance, before I was born about like 30 years ago, um, I'm only 23. So when I go to their house, I see all these giant trees all over the place surrounding their whole yard and like a perfect thing where I'm like, did you just cut out an acre plot and put it here? They're like, no, when we first bought the house and I saw older photos when they very first got it like 40, 50 years ago, there was nothing. It's an open country field. And then they planted those trees that I've always known. And I'm like, that's crazy how you played the waiting game on 20 something, 30 something years for trees to start sprouting. And then now literally turn into this backyard that you pictured. It's like, I don't have the patience to do that. I'm the type that's like, let me buy a full grown tree and put it in the ground. Yeah. And imagine then that the, the house goes, you know, not, not that I'm saying it will, but just imagine that situation. If the house then becomes ruined and, you know, people abandoned it and eventually there's no sign above ground of a house at all. What you're left with is basically a fossil of where the house was. And, you know, to bring it back to archaeology, this is exactly what we do is to try and unpick the environment. Why does it look that way? Who's planted it? Um, who's done, who's done, well, I've got a bee flying at me. That was a bee. Yeah. Look you at really it. are there's, in a cottage, a aren't you? Yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm in a pod at the moment in the garden. So it looks like you're in heaven stuff. from the video. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a podcast from my pod, um, which is where all podcasts should really be uh, done from. I, I really say. need to change my fucking room then. <laughs> on a square block um it's funny because my grandpa when he built his house um there was a point he was telling me about because you walk up onto his porch and there's a tree coming out of the porch and i'm like was that did it, what, what happened here did it just grow through and he goes no i just i it was going to cost more money to cut it and remove it i decided fuck it i'm going to add it into my house and i was like that's interesting how like i wouldn't have even thought about doing that but you notice Without like they took out that tree, I think last year because it ended up falling over after it was hit by lightning. And it's like there's something different about the whole thing now. There's no shade where it was shade before. There's like and we might say it might take the long waiting game 50 years for these trees to grow. Sure. But in the grand aspect of life or wildlife taking over something that's not supposed to be part of the land that was fabricated by man. 50 years is not long at all. That's a, that's a, that's a very small drop in a giant bucket of the expansion of the earth. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great thing to do as well. You know, we've, we, we have developed a way of life that is so separate from the rest of the natural world that, you know, what we need to be doing is, is actually bringing all of these things, you know, to live closer to, to, to nature, live closer to wildlife. I love, I love the idea. I'd love to have a tree growing through my house. Uh, unfortunately, you know, living in a having a pod I, as my office in the garden is as close as I can get. But even that, that's that's good. I love that. I love being able to be, you know, surrounded by these these creatures. What's um your dream scenario of like a heavenly place for you? Not like um like what would your ideal environment be? I always talk about if I had like a a, a good amount of money, I would build a little studio, just a one little small place for myself with like. But I would have a giant window where I'm looking straight ahead right now instead of just a wall. I would have a giant window that was overlooking some water where I could like do like amazing things like build a garden or something. But at the same time, probably fill it with a bunch of like crazy exotic animals and just have them run rampant like my own zoo. <laughs> yeah, I love that idea. Um, 
I don't know if I if I if I had all the money in the world. I don't know. I think I would still carry on living in the same place that I live in at the moment. I've got this. I have. I think it's because we we moved here only a couple of years ago, a little bit before lockdown, in fact. And we we spent lockdown in our in our quarry, and um, I just I I love it. I feel completely at home here. I feel it's it's a it's a strange feeling. I feel like every atom of my body wants to disintegrate and go into the soil. That's why I, I want to burrow in even further and become just like mud, basically. Well, you, I just want to become mud in this garden. You pick the best profession to be an archaeologist if you like dirt. Yeah. I don't like to get my hands dirty, um, mostly because I just, I have OCD. I got to clean it immediately. But, uh, you know, once you get like camping, for instance, I would like to go back before we ended up ruining the sky to where I couldn't see the stars as much as I do before. Because that's like the one thing that I think can really change your aspect of what life is when you look up in the stars and you realize how minuscule you are. Don't take it as a way as that you don't mean anything. Take it as a way as that every problem that you have in front of you right now is so minuscule in the grand aspect of just the hum of life. I mean, I, I used to do my recordings like every other day or whenever I had a day off, I would just record, record, record. Now I'm on the aspect of I want to set them all for one day. So then when I do have my day off, I can truly go outside, sit, take in the scenery, get a little hammered. I don't know, but it's, it's an experience. You know, when you really walk outside and you can feel the warmth on your skin, there's people out there that can't even, don't even know what that's like. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, talking about the, the, the dark skies, at night, I mean, that's our, that's what our ancestors would have seen. You know, they would have been sat around the campfire. They would have been looking up at the, at the stars. They would have seen them clearly. They would have told their stories they would have talked about their their gods, their goddesses, their myths, their legends, and you know I want to do that. I want to get back to that. I want to, I, you know, I do. I try and do that with my children. You know, just lie in the garden and let's let's tell stories. I had a talk with my friend. Um, well, it's my buddy's mom's uh, boyfriend. That's a fucking mouthful and a half. But I was talking to him about the Amish people. I was like, yeah, I came across some Amish people at my local gas station. And I was like, holy. And it was the time when they turned 18, Rumspringa, where they go out and explore the world and see if they want to live out here. Or they want to go back and live the nice, peaceful, easy lifestyle of, well, it's not easy, but compared to everything that the world deals with with social media is probably might be a tad bit easier. They don't believe in COVID, by the way. Um, they don't have cell phones. That's what they said. That's their answer they gave me. I was like, okay, respect. Um, but he was telling me, he's like, yeah, I used to actually work with Amish people. You know, you used to go, like if you had, you get some food from their market. He goes, it's really weird. I don't know how they deal with the sanitary stuff because they don't really shower. And, um, but he goes, when you needed something welded on your truck, they would weld it for half the price of what a garage would cost you. And they're good at what they do. They can build homes. I'm like, yeah, if you really look at the Amish lifestyle, you really wouldn't miss everything that we have now, like bills. Bills are because we have appliances that we want the luxury of using. And if we don't use them, we lose them. Amish people don't have to worry about that. They use candlelight instead of electricity. Mortgage on a house or paying for property or paying whatever you got to pay. They build their own house. They cut around that. They make so much money where they don't have to ever worry about paying bills because they don't have any bills. It's all theirs. It's all man-made. And I go, yeah, they probably don't have a want to know what the cell phone is, to want to know what all these devices are because they've never had it in their life. It's like if someone asked me, what would you like to, if you were bald? I don't know. I've never been bald. So I, I don't know what that experience, what it could get me. Could I get laid even more if I was bald? I don't know, but I don't want to experience it because I'm not. <laughs> well, as, as someone who's who's uh, gradually going uh, bald. I see some um, <laughs> I want to know what the experience is like. I hope it is, uh, as you describe it. Getting laid every day. <laughs> <laughs> obviously not. Obviously not. Happily married with children. <laughs> but with like the Amish, for instance, like if I could offer you right now, like to take away all the memory of ever using a device or anything that made your life so simple, that would take you away from your basic roots. Cause if you look throughout our history back in the day when there was tribals or there was tribes and there was groups and community, there was a lot more working to survive rather than working just to see if you can make someone's career go down the shitter on Twitter or mm. on Instagram mm. or on whatever platform you want, where I'm like, our problems have gotten lessened, but they've actually been doubled in a different aspect when it comes to a mentality draining experience, physicality, 
physical actions used to be the only draining experience that you would, would have when you're, and I think creativity was different too. Folklores and fairy tales and myths and things that last throughout the eras of time that we still look at back at today. They were told around a campfire. Inspiration was created in the moment of surviving and trying to make the time pass till the next day when you can go and hunt or forage or build. And now it's like, how many people are just playing all night Call of Duty sessions talking about banging your mom on the internet? And I'm like, oh my God, it's like, what happened to us? Yeah, I know. But the thing is that it's not, it's not one or the other, is it? I mean, I don't think it's one or the other in a way. I'd like to, you know, the world that I want to create is not one or the other it's about having you know we are where we are we do you know i happily use an iphone or um you know my computers and so on you know i love this technology that we're talking over right now you know it's really made especially over the last year it's made teaching at university much much uh, easier but it's not so it's it's not about losing that technology it's just trying to forge a world where it's we can use it in a much better happier way you know I, I love twitter i love using twitter but i don't engage with the, the hate you know i don't often actually even see the hate and i'm quite happy with that you know yeah it's my it's my little echo chamber but i i, I you know i'm okay with that too and you know i just i i i find that you know people there's t there's too much jabber going on in the world anyway and people always chucking in their opinions where it's not really wanted or needed or they have a particularly interesting point of view on it people just throw in their opinions i don't do that you know my my twitter feed is mostly hey i've been on this walk and isn't this doesn't this look good isn't this interesting isn't this bit of nature isn't this bit of archaeology interesting and i try and follow interesting people that do similar kind of things or have something and i think if we all did that if we stopped engaging with those you know tweets that are designed to make you angry or the headlines on the new you know news headlines which is they're literally designed by people with psychology degrees to make you angry so you click on it and get even angrier just stop engaging with things like that and move away from it and actually get back to um you know don't lose your technology but get back to a simpler happier way of thinking and carry on telling those stories that we've always told I look at it like I know so many people that refresh their social media pages all the time just to see if they lost or gained a follower and then they freak out and harvest mm -hmm. over that. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not about that. I only see my only issue is like I was sitting in front of my computer the other day trying to get guests for the podcast scrolling through and I'm like looking at people's profile pictures. I'm like, this is the eyes of crazy mental health issues. Skip that person. I'm like, keep scrolling down until I find someone that looks like, okay, this person's not bad. They have normal stuff on there. But then like I've come across people where I'm like, oh, their picture's fine. I always go by the crazy eyes and then I click on it <laughs> and there's like 10,000 tweets to Donald Trump. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, I can't like, I get it. Everyone has an opinion that should be valued, but now opinions have turned to things that are now fact or law where people say, mm -hmm. you don't agree with me. So then you're wrong. And I'm like, why don't you just respect the other person has a different intellectual side or a different intellectual thought? We're all basis of information. We're all processing. You're a fan of landscapes, for instance. I'm hoping, which I didn't know. I thought it was a discontinued research program, but plant perception where we thought plants had feelings and emotions. They did case studies on it. Apparently there's still a group Group or an organization that's still like a group of scientists still researching into that now realizing that plants have a different intellectual thinking we base intelligence off of what is human intelligence or what's similar to human intelligence we didn't think about uh plant uh intelligence when it comes to the aspect of they're able to change the flavor of their leaves so bugs will stop eating them they're able to send nutrients through their roots to be able to help each other out when they need different nutrients and i'm like that's intelligent as shit to me. I couldn't do anything without my cell phone. My cell phone's a device that is able to unlock my capabilities. Uh, I, I love the, I love the idea of the wood wide web. I mean, I just I find it extraordinary. And I love, you know, I just love walking around woodlands and, you know, getting that feeling. You don't need to know necessarily, you know, the, the, you don't need to know everything about them, but just the feeling you get back from them. It's really tremendously rewarding places. I think, I mean, what, one of the things that I, I think we've lost, and I think, that, you know, Twitter and, and all these other social media sites have made much worse, is the lack of face-to-face of -face conversation. You know, it's so much, it's so easy to be angry with someone, isn't it, when you can't actually see them, they're just this, you know, they're just this, this an idea, an abstract idea floating somewhere in cyberspace. 
And um, it kind of it makes me think of, uh, you know, in, in the Neolithic period in Britain, we, we created these great big uh, monuments known as henge monuments, which were like sort of big arenas. And um, obviously we have no idea what they were built for, but it seemingly they were built to um, as, as sort of aggregation points where people could get together, you know, especially uh, in these small scale societies where people are dotted around the landscape and living, you know, essentially for quite a lot of the year, quite remote lives from one another. It's, a, it's somewhere that you could come once or twice a year at particular points of the year and, and all get together and see each other eye to eye. And it's that eye to eye meetings and that eye to eye, you know, the, 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 or the face to face conversations that are really important you know the, the, you can thresh out all sorts of you know problems and issues oi your cattle have been trampling my crops or you know marriage alliances or you know you flirt with one another or or, or you know what, whatever it is make friends and so on and so on and I just I just think that quite often we, we we lose that you know with this this huge global world in which we live in um you know bring back the henge I say I got one for you. My favorite thing that I want to learn about more Stonehenge. Don't you love something where I had a buddy of mine from the UK tell me he goes Stonehenge. Well, we don't know what it is. It's all of our heritage. I'm like, cause I was like talking about building a home by it and like maintaining it and making it my own. And he's like, well, it's all of our cultural heritage. And I'm like, I like that. Nothing is, Oh, it's only the UK. Nothing is only it's America. Nothing is only it's Canada. Nothing is only one place's heritage. It's for everyone to be shared, everyone to understand this is prehistory, and we don't know the function of it. We have ideas of what it means, but not knowing it can piss a lot of people off. But to me, I love that. I love that there's so many different – because to me, true creativity – is that anybody can pull something different out of the thing that you have created, not just one specific label that we want to label so much in today's time. I'm like, I like the idea that you think this sunrise brings this certain memory to your head. And to me, this sunrise brings this certain memory to my head. We're two different. It's the same thing, but two different outcomes and we're not fighting about it we're just talking and sharing each other's wisdom and experience through our lives that we have combinated i'm like i find that that's the best thing to me is i want to create something that's like everyone's like what the hell is that i'm like i don't know what the hell that is it looks like this and goes i don't know like a cloud when i look up at a cloud and you look up at a cloud we're going to look at the same cloud but we're going to see two different things and it's all a matter of perspective yeah absolutely it's the, it's the social value of these things and that's, you know, absolutely right with Stonehenge or any other monument in the, you know, from the past, not just from prehistory, but, you know, there is heritage that belongs to all of us. And it's for the for everyone, all of humanity, not just, you know, one small select group, not just, you know, um, a bunch of white people of a you know certain background. It's for absolutely everybody. And we all can see it and, and we all have different we place different values on it and all of those values are of equal importance. I think that leads up probably to one of the biggest core issues we have today is everything that we have is so divisive, not just with actual devices, but everything has to be, this is mine or this is this, or this is America's issue, or this is this country's issue. I'm like, man, it's kind of like a world impact here. It's a chain leading effect. I don't think everyone realizes how much influence we have into everyone else's life. Like we're all like, if I do something, if I don't choose to go to work, then someone has to cover my shift. If I don't choose to do this, then someone has to do that. There's all this very small trickle down effect that realize that we all have this giant influence in each other's lives. And instead of trying to change or distort, understand, be more accepting. And it's so much easier said than done. There are some people I'm like, what is the hell are you talking about? But then there's other things where I look at, like, I can see your perspective, that perspective change on a lot of things, instead of looking at uh, plants or looking at a lawn that's filled up with really tall grass that looks like a jungle and someone needs to cut it, instead of thinking maybe someone needs to cut it, look at it as a way of like, this is what the land used to be like. This is what everything used to be like back in the day. If we could turn back time, a Dr. Manhattan character comes down and goes, I'm going to take you back to the original plan of the earth. And you come back and you're like, there's so much green everywhere where's the homes where's the houses well this is what it was like before now it's going to be like what it's going to be like later is there's going to be homes that no one lives in they all look the fucking same and they're going to tear up land and it's going to be empty because no one can afford any of these homes and it's like then why build them because we want to expand it's like well the plants want to do the same thing don't they 
Absolutely, yeah. We we live in these little rabbit hutches, don't we? But you know, I, I'm I'm speaking as a as a, as a privileged white man, and I can you know I I, I have a, a wonderful house where I'm able to have bits of land that I can turn over into. Um, into you have an infinity thing. pool. No, I don't, I don't. And you're not I a privileged white man unless you have an infinity pool. Uh, I have no interest in an infinity pool. <laughs> what? I've, got, I've got a I've got a pond. Does that count? Hey, if it's nature, does it have swans in it? No. Oh. It's got frogs and newts. That's good too. It's, yeah. quite, it's quite small. Well, let's see if you ever watch a pond or watch a like what sea life comes out of that thing. Where you look at like an amphibian when they go from a tadpole and then they see a giant frogs, like every day I'll hear like just in like a little canal or something by my house, I'll hear bullfrogs, the banjo. It sounds like a oh, banjo okay. pluck. And I'm like, that's you will notice like when you truly take a minute and step outside every problem that you have going on in your own head, there's so much more out there, a balance of an ecosystem and environment that is somehow surviving and self-sustaining and refreshing. The best example I could give you is when an ocean wave hits the sand and it turns up that new sand and puts down the old or recedes back. It's this constant reuse and reflush of this just immense power in such a way you can't even really describe it. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the world, isn't it? I, that's what I, that's what I love about it. I love getting out and walking and just seeing the world like that. I've got a, it's a it's a curiosity that I've had since a kid, and I've never I've, I've held on to that. And I think that's what we need to do: hold on to it and listen to the bullfrogs, and you know, let your imagination go wild. If you had, uh, especially with archaeology, for instance, what's the best thing you're trying to describe to people? Like if you're going to be, a, you're going to lecture to students or if you're going to talk to someone about it, what's the one thing that you really try and grab hold or really try and show people what you enjoy out of it? Out of archaeology more generally, I'd, I mean, the, 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 the people that I normally talk to are a self-selecting group of people because they're people that generally already love archaeology. But to me, I mean, archaeology is, is just a way of, of seeing the world. It's kind of, I think, in, in, in some ways, so I'm not a religious person. OK, um, I, that, you know, that, 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 that flew some years ago. I'm not but either. I think, yeah, but I think that I've, what I've done, because I do think that we need we need that. We need a belief in something. We need, or there's at least there's some part of our soul that requires something to cling on to. And I've kind of filled that with with archaeology. To me, archaeology has filled that gap. And and so I, I walk around the whole world and I see it. You know, I see the archaeology around me. I, I love walking through the landscapes and seeing the, the the field boundaries and the paths and reconstructing that. So, so to me, archaeology is is a, a way of seeing the world and a way of trying to understand how people who lived in this world before we occupied it, um, how they saw that world and how what they were trying to do, because essentially we're all trying to do exactly the same thing, aren't we? We're all just here to survive. Um, and we all want to do that in, in all sorts of different ways. And people, different groups and different societies have done that in different ways, depending on where and when they were living. Um, and it, to me, that's that, that's awe inspiring. So when you talk about the the, you know, looking up at the stars at night and feeling very, very tiny and that's actually a good thing you know it really makes you feel it makes you feel like this little you know all these problems dissolve away and it makes you feel a bit part for me archaeology does that as well you know i just feel like this small um you know infinitesimally small little mote of dust in a in the vast expanse of humanity and my problems that have been you know vexing me that particular day because you know why doesn't my why doesn't this student understand that why does this you know, colleague of mine demand this and don't they understand this, this and this. All of these little tiny problems that we all have, they, they just dissolve away. They disappear when you start looking. When For me, when I start thinking about my place in, in that in that timeline, in that humanity, in all of humanity's timeline, I should say. Do you ever wonder what you're leaving behind? Like, I know we look at examinations through history and we can look at the past and then we look at like, oh, I bet these people at that time never thought we'd be researching about them. My uh, grandma had passed away in March and we didn't know this, but like my, we've been cleaning out and getting all her stuff from her old house. And we, my mom lifted up one of these vases and under the vase, it said to my mom, a message to her that was 
taped and it was written 1970. So that's like 50 something years. And I'm like, damn, like you understand why she didn't want you like sending all of her stuff to stores to sell or going to a thrift store. She had left messages all over where you don't know that could my mom would have never came across that if she would have just thrown it out or if she would have gave it to some store. But she looked under it and found that some random person could have found that in 2050 and been like, who the hell's Marla? That's my mom's name. Like, you know, who's who the hell's this person? It's like that. You don't. That's what I like is like, I wonder if I do that now what who will come across that there was a person that found a message in a bottle um it was a a giant thing you can look up uh the girl had died she got into a car accident um in like 2019 and this bottle was just found like last month and it had a phone number on it and it was the girl's old cell phone and the mom had not discontinued the phone had kept the phone as like a memory thing i don't know if she kept paying the plan or whatever it was but i guess or she started using it or something like that but she got a a voicemail and it was this guy saying i found this bottle i found your bottle or whatever and it had the favorite quote from bill and ted's excellent adventure and it was like oh. it, it had some some quote i can't repeat that i don't know what it was but she called left they left a voicemail the lady called back and there's this whole news story about it and it's like this all inspiring thing i'm like yeah you don't know like how many people like when they leave the locks on the fence and there's like j and k forever and they end up getting divorced after 10 kids and then whatever happens there. But you look at like the journey, who's going to come across a piece that you leave behind you. I look at it like um, my buddy said to me, he goes, yeah, I, had, I always whenever you go on a hike, you grab a walking stick, always a walking stick. You always got the like, so, like cool. You just attracted to it like a lightsaber for a Jedi. And my buddy goes, yeah, I, I just stuck the walking stick right in the ground and left it for the next person to have. And I was like. You left it for the next person because, yeah, someone's going to use that stick on a walk and hopefully they'll do the same thing I did. And it repeats and repeats and repeats. And I'm like, yeah, but I was if some dude like me just, just looked at it like a stick and starts banging it against a tree he goes. And that's what the stick ends up doing. But for that, I found that out of off the beaten path and I left it on the path for someone to be able to find. And I'm like, damn, le- leaving small messages. Yeah, I love that. That's actually that's what we should all be doing. shouldn't we? We're thinking about other people. We're leaving something behind for other people to use. It's not about mine, mine, mine. It's about, uh, I, I love that idea. And yeah, I mean, you know, you said, do I ever think about what I'm leaving behind all the time? You know, I think that that's what, I think that that's what thinking archaeologically does. It makes you think about your footprint, you know, so, which is exactly why, you know, I lie in the garden and I think about what does this, what will this house here look like if, you know, no one was ever to move into it? after us and it, all of humanity was just to disappear and, and nature to take its course what does that archaeology look like well i mean it would be you know it becomes stratified layers wouldn't it layers of glass and concrete and stone um but you know at, at some point as the the, the rafters rot and give in and the roof collapses you know i suppose the the first floor concertina down into the ground floor my bookshelves will become you know, what will happen to the books? I mean, they've become, I suppose they tip over and they've become some kind of PT lair. Um, and, you know, you, you'd, I suppose, get things living in it and burrowing into them. And, and eventually, you know, you're just left with this sort of layers of, of materials. An archaeologist in the future could come along and excavate and reinterpret and reconstruct to a certain amount what my life and my family's life would have looked like. They wouldn't have, we wouldn't be able to get it completely right. And they wouldn't necessarily know our names and our, our language and the rest of it, but they could reconstruct to a certain extent our lives. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that, that to me would be wonderful. I, I, I kind of, it's a weird fantasy, I appreciate, but I kind of have this fantasy of what, what they would, how, what they make for that. And I think that would be a great tribute to us. And I, I see that in the same way when I reconstruct the lives of Neolithic, um, you know, of, of, of Neolithic people in the past. Um, you know, I try and get into their head. I can't, of course, but I've got to try. I mean, that's literally what my job is, is to try and understand them and to reconstruct their lives the best I can. And that's the greatest honour I can offer them is to, 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 to build on, you know, to, to try and understand them better and through that understand myself better and the world in which I live and the world, the way in which I want to live that life. 
I don't think in a million years the people who built the pyramids or the Sphinx would have thought that their whole entire monuments or whatever they were building these things for were going to end up being something that we would look at as national beauties or treasures that literally people go there to see what they would call an enlightenment of God. You know, it's like I'm so glad that like, for instance, like Mount Everest. It's very, very dangerous to do that. I'm so glad it is because I think that's like one of the natural things out there that really hasn't been influenced or touched in a certain way. I like that there's these things that we have that are natural, these land zones, these Yellowstone, for instance, is a big one a lot of people mention, but it's not the same because you end up it might preserve part of that area but you've affected around it and it taints the soil and after a while that soil starts to lead and corrode the rest of it even if you're not even in that area you could be a couple miles away a small little in or fraction of just a, a slight measure of influence that's not supposed to naturally be there affects the whole ecosystem and throws it out of whack you know you start to see uh, like geysers for instance there's probably a shit ton of them back in the day we have a lot of deactive ones but hey back in the day it was probably a big issue for a lot of people oh are you gonna cook some food tonight yeah i'm just gonna throw it over to the geyser you know what i'm saying it's like it's interesting to look in that mindset have your mind go off on some things because i think it brings some more interest into history and as much as people like history or like looking into it to try and sort out all the craziness that happened with it I'm not talking about archaeology or anthropology i'm mostly talking about when someone learns the real history of the real story of christopher columbus and they lose their shit um much like you should but it's from an anthropologist perspective, you got to think at the time period that that was in what they were thinking. They didn't think it was going to the world. We've, we've evolved in 20 years. The cell phone, the Internet has hit in such mass capabilities where when you were 10, 11 years old, you would have never thought that we would be in the direction where you could talk to someone from the U.S. through your Zoom computer right now. It's bonkers, isn't it? It's absolutely bonkers. I think, I mean, you know, going back to what you were saying about uh, uh, landscapes and, and sort of natural landscapes and Yellowstone and stuff. I think that you know it's key to remember that there are no there are no natural landscapes anywhere because landscapes are constantly being altered and adjusted and changed. I think you know you, you really have to go back to the end of the last glaciation and watch the landscape being rewild, and then there you have a, a proper wild wood. Nothing we look at now is 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 genuinely world and that's okay you know all of these things are, are, are influenced in some way or other by human action and yeah that's that's good i think you know go and go and be awed by it but at the same time we've got to we've also got to preserve what's there we've got to try and prevent everything from becoming a um you know a, a shopping mall or or, or whatever you know we've, we've got to, we've got to stop people i just you know it really bugs me when i see um you know Deserts becoming massive five-star hotel complexes, and I don't even is... recognize my childhood town anymore. It's changed in the past couple of years. I mean, when I was a kid, there used to be like there was the old library. Now they've built a brand new one, and now the old one's going to end up being destroyed. It's just vacant right now. And I'm like, there's and it's it's it got really popular it's known as uh, america's greatest small town which i'm like who the fuck's handing out awards to that place for that because i remember a person got stabbed on the side of the street when i was little but i look at it now it's like it's hardly really i mean it's nice it's but it's new it's way too new there was an old retro movie store where you could go and buy the dvds when you had to go in person before netflix play a pinball game you know on the old school pinball machines now it's what a verizon wireless store and i'm like Man, I, I get it. And I'm like, I get it because the, the new kids, that's going to be the nostalgia for them when they grow, you know, when they get older, that's what they're living in. That's what they're used to. But I look at it like there is so much, especially during COVID, how many businesses and people started to work from home where businesses decided, let the people work from home. They don't need to come into the office. They're more effective at home. Turn those into art places. And when I mean art places, I mean therapy, monuments, statues, things that boost the morale of people. So when someone's going on a walk, they can sit down and sit by a memorial or sit by some type of landscape or architecture type thing that some artists created to be able to truly take in like, man, I'm not really worried about my car payment or my electric or any of the problems right going on in my life right now. I'm kind of in this moment and I'm looking at the natural beauty of things, you know? Mm -hmm. When I, when I, you know, yeah, absolutely. When I, when I worked in, um, I used to work in, in what was called commercial archaeology. So when we used to go into, onto building sites and excavate the archaeology that's going to be impacted by that development. And uh, I used to do it in London. 
uh, which was obviously constantly and still is constantly being developed. A lot of those buildings that I worked on, I, wor I cleared the archaeology for back then, have were, were constructed into big, you know, high rise office blocks and so on. Those themselves have come round and are now being demolished and new ones built in their place. So I've, I've sort of seen this cycle um, and archaeologists being able to get back into old excavations and sort of complete areas that we hadn't, we didn't at the time have the chance to look at. Um, and, you know, at some point it's all got to stop, hasn't it? All of this constant, endlessly redeveloping, but I suppose that's just humanity. It's just that, you know, it's, it's become more destructive now, um, you know, at least back in the Neolithic period when they built the new, the new sets of monuments came along and everyone started doing that. The old monuments get, uh, they don't get completely erased. They get sort of repurposed and reused, but they don't get destroyed altogether. Well, there was two people that reacted to the mentality. If, if it's not broke, don't fix it. There was the yeah. people that said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Then there became a group of people that are now the majority where it's, I'm going to make a break so I can fix it. And then like, for instance, the Walmart I used to have 10 years ago was just a regular Walmart. They decided we're going to condemn this building and build a super Walmart right behind it, which they did. And eventually they exploded the other one and tore it down. And it's the same Walmart. It just has a greenhouse or green area so you can buy plants, which I'm like, cool. But you could have just added that on as a separate thing rather than go through all the materials. That, well, no, we wanted to expand. It's That's everything. Everything just expands. Mm -hmm. We have um near my town is a bunch of community homes that look exactly like the one beside it. Literally, I got lost for an hour and a half in the cul-de-sac there was a water park back there i was like where the fuck am i i was like this isn't my home but there are so many homes that are vacant because they can't people can't afford to live in those things so i'm like what's the point of having this there well in case we do get someone that goes in there i'm like you just tore up what two miles of just straight trees and all that for this like really it's not it, you have them right over there like not even a mile down the road why do you need them here well this area is better we can build a fountain i'm like cool the fountain's awesome but at the same time i'm not it's not worth taking down trees that take ages to grow oh yeah that's that, i mean that, that's the big problem and that's happening everywhere isn't it is that this this march of development has a habit of actually of, of of removing things from the natural world which are irreplaceable or take a very very long time to replace well it, I mean, don't... it used to be like this thing of like I, I want nature there, but I want it in my backyard. Now it's like, I don't want to see a, a fucking sliver of evidence of it even existing. I want grass, but I also like artificial grass. I like trees, but I only want one tree. I don't want a bunch of them going around. And I'm like, when did we decide that like, we just don't want any of it here at all. We just rather have building upon building upon building upon building. If you talk to anyone from major cities in the States, they'll tell you, man, it's like a vacation out here. I'm like, what? Because you have room to breathe and walk. Like I'm in a beach town. I smell air 24 seven of salt water. It's amazing. I I'm so used to it. People go, this is a vacation spot for me. I'm like, it's home. I want to go out to the mountains. I want to go experience something I have not seen because all I've seen is sand and water, sand and water. It's beautiful. Sure. I'll send you some sunset and some sunrise photos. That'll blow your fucking mind. But I want to see a river. I want to see a nice tree. I want to see things that I don't really have because all we have here are really scrawny, skinny ones because it's just we want homes here, not really the area of landscapes. I don't want to see my fucking neighbors. That's the big thing. <laughs> I think, I mean, that, that, that is the human urge to, to, to see other things, isn't it? It's to, to move around and to see different landscapes. That's existed. That's why we... That's why we've spread, you know, that's why we left Africa and we spread to every single possible corner of the world. It's, it's just this, this desire for humans to keep moving and, you know, combined with a sort of curiosity, um, it's, it's why we've come to dominate the planet. That's OK. And, and, and go with those feelings. But we've got to we've got to somehow protect what's left of the natural world. I think, well end up getting a better grasp but i mean with the environmental push that we're all really seeing but i'm like man how much of it is actually doing what they're saying they're supposed to be doing like PETA, PETA's not doing anything good for anybody they're doing the dumbest ways of like banning animal slurs i'm like okay but you have a very important role to play and you're not really doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing environmental places they do 
They do what they're trying to do by stopping like oil spills and trying to do all this stuff, but they get out moneyed. And it's like, man, we should have the people that are trying to take care of the world for future generations. Like I look in the future aspect, what's going to be like for my grandkids, what's going to be like for my little nephew when he grows up, he's growing up in a world where I've, I had social media and all this stuff when I was 13, he had it when he was born. So it's like very, very strange to see what the implications of what that's going to do for future generations, which is what I'm worried about. The mental health crisis is not getting better. It's getting worse. I think that's a combination of technology, social media, the influences that we can all see like a bomb go off in a fucking town square on our cell phones, but also the fact there's not a whole lot of environment that's really bringing like a sense of calm and it's going to be okay when you look at a sunrise or a sunset and you realize this one thing that I'm looking at is everyone is experiencing this, but we're all pulling something different out of it. It's an information that is getting projected into our heads that we're all getting a piece of a giant puzzle to. Yeah, and you know, that, that's why getting out into the natural world is so important. Going for that walk and having access to that landscape and being able to get out and, and walk and walk safely as well is so important. Um, you know, that's that, it's exactly that. And, you know, this what is it with this artificial grass? Why are people putting artificial grass down? And, you know, this, this fad for putting decking on absolutely everything. You know, we need the grass we need that natural world and it's so much more interesting exciting um you know there's there's entire worlds in there you know you can look up at the stars but look down into the ground and there are entire universes within that bit of ground it makes you feel good it makes you feel connected it makes you feel part of the world and that's something that i think that we have lost to a certain amount and we need to get back well, however that is, and I, and I think that there is a change, you know, it feels to me like there's a change, and I'm not necessarily someone with my finger on the pulse, so maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like things have, have, have turned a corner a bit, there's more of an acceptance of climate change, and a sense that we do need to be doing something, even if we're not quite there yet, even if we're not quite doing that thing we need to do, even just accepting that, for me, feels like a, a result right now, um, so, you know, I feel like we, I think, I, I feel like things are changing. And I think the last year has really made us all engage with the environment around us in a really different way. Well, what after I, I, three weeks of shutdown in Venice, dolphins started coming back into the channel and the water was getting clear. And it's like, you hear that type of thing. It's like, what else could we do if we just put a halt, which I was like, yeah, lockdown was good for, you know, the planet wasn't good for the people that were trying to survive the economy and all that. But I look at an aspect of like, what are you willing? You know, I think it's about the sales pitch when the start of all these industries and companies, oil, gas, whatever you want to say was being the idea of being pushed onto the table in a giant board meeting room. I like to picture, I think if someone would have sale pitched it like this, yeah, this is going to be cheaper and it's going to be more effective. But if we find the way to spend more money, and as soon as you say more money, people are like roll their eyes like, fuck, I don't want to spend more money. So the idea is already tossed out. But you go, but if we spend more money, we can find a better effective way where the real reward is the fact that this planet is going to last longer than we're doing to it right now. But it wasn't sale pitched that way. It was because uh, it's all a, a, a characteristic of people that have never cared about the generation after them. And I think that's what's mm -hmm. interesting about the generations that are going on now is they have a giant push for the future generations. They want it to be the best thing possible, which is like. Any time before, any generation has never cared. Like I was going back to my buddy's mom's boyfriend. I was asking him, I was like, what do you think about this? He goes, it's not going to be in my lifetime. I'm like, that's why we're in the fucking situation we're in. Because people like you never, he's like, I don't care. It doesn't affect me. I won't be alive. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, I, that's it. It's, it's all about what we're, you know, I, I love, I love archaeology and I look to the past and I try and follow these footsteps, but it's all about the footsteps we leave, you know, the footprints we leave behind and looking to the future as well. And that's the most key thing. And, and, you know, to be honest, my generation is being shown up and generations above me are being shown up by the, the, the younger generations. To be honest. My children have a better understanding of climate change and what's needed and what they need to do than I think anyone in in my generation and you know people in the what we call the baby boomer generation you know I think that, that, that there's there's a better understanding of of what's required and that gives me some hope I do think that I think that the future is positive I do too but we've, Jim. Got, 
we've got to fight. We've got to fight for we've got to fight for the landscape around us. We've got to fight for the preservation of the natural world because you know we have such destructive machinery nowadays that we can do things that we could never do in the past. You know, it's no longer small scale. It's on a massive, massive scale, and and there's big money involved. So we've got to fight for it. But I have a lot of positivity about the future. I do too, Jim. And I, I appreciate you for doing my podcast, man. I know it was a, a weird experience getting a random message about doing a show, but you know, you gave me that chance and that's all it really takes. And I, I would love to have you on again, if you want to come back on the podcast too. Oh, I'd love to come back. I'd love to come back. Well, Jim, where can people find, uh, is it just your Twitter page or do, is there another links that you have you want to promote? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not great at social media. I should be much better because I love being connected um uh but tw- at the moment twitter is my is the is the main way that i you can access me publicly um and you know i'm just i'm just going to carry on doing my walks i'm writing about walking in the past and um you know that's that's just sort of taking over my life at the moment so hopefully at some point i'll have a book uh about you know moving around um, and walking in the past and all of these things that we've talked about. But What's... right right now, I need to go and lie in the garden and just kind of mm-hmm. merge back into the mud. What's um, the book called? Uh, at the moment, it's called Rome. Uh, R-O-A-M. Um, but, uh, you know, they, these things may change. But, yeah, at the moment, it's about Rome. And it's about the human the human urge to roam, exactly what we've been talking about, this, this desire just to move around the landscape, to create footprints, to create paths, and then paths lead to tracks and routeways, and they lead to big roads, and the great big American open road, you know, I love all of these things. Um, it excites me so much, but they all have an origin somewhere. So well, it's about those. I'll make sure I'm going to link your links in the description as well. I'm definitely going to have you on when you create that book too. Hopefully sooner than that too, as well, depending on when your release for the book is, but Jim, it's been a pleasure having you on. Is there anything you want to say to the people out there before we end it? Get walking guys, get out there, enjoy the landscape and get walking.